I would highlight today uh, three uh, topics. Uh, first of all, uh, clear and explicit requirements. Test, uh, second is test strategy. And uh, uh, number three is version control setup. So let's start with the clear and explicit requirements. So here I would like uh, yeah, to highlight that the user story, that requirement from the uh, uh, for the development should be specific enough to provide the development team with a clear understanding what is expected. So on the, uh, let me just put a lazy pointer here. On the left side, we have the representation of simplified representation of the business requirement. So let's say business wants to uh, add a, a new field to a lead object. So uh, this simple version of the ticket is taken by the developer. And I have heard from time to time such stories like developer grabs the story, adds the ticket, uh, sorry, uh, creates a field, uh, moved it, uh, moved it to production, and as a result, yeah, nobody sees it because uh, the field was not added to layouts. Uh, nobody was assigned uh, so profiles and permission wasn't set up to uh, access these field. So to limit uh, that that kind of issues, uh, uh, we recommend to use template based user stories. So. The story contains, first of all, business personas. Uh, we would, uh, I would uh, uh, describe what is it uh, uh, in, yeah, in the next slide. And uh, apart from that, it should contain uh, acceptance criteria. So here we see that uh, fields should be displayed on all page layouts. Uh, the uh, list views uh, that uh, should have this field added, and so on. Uh, about sales personas, uh, I uh, during my uh, experience, I uh, always noticed that this step is always missed, but it's a, a, a meaningful um, meaningful step uh, because uh, we develop functionality for somebody. So we could have a lot of Salesforce users in the uh, in the company and based on their permissions we can group them uh, and define so-called personas and uh, we always recommend uh, before the project kickoff uh, define the business personas prepare the personas matrix as an uh, in the example below so we have all the short description what uh, this persona uh, what, what actions uh, uh, Persona performs. And apart from that, developers see that, okay, so uh, this Persona could have the following Salesforce uh, profiles and permission sets. Uh, test strategy. Uh, this is, uh, uh, so what I mean by that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the team members responsible for testing in test environment before the release and in production environment after release. Because uh, if we have a dedicated QA engineer, that uh, yeah, becomes easier. But from time to time, project is not include, does not include uh, the, the dedicated QA engineer. In this case, yeah, some, uh, somebody sh should take uh, a role of the uh, QA engineer in the test environment. It can be developer, it can be business representative, uh, but yeah, uh, the test cases in this case should be prepared by the team, not by the uh, dedicated QA uh, engineer. And yeah, the last prerequisite I would like to highlight is version control setup. Uh, yeah, probably you all, you all know what is it, uh, just want to uh, highlight the main advantages of that, that we can track what exactly was changed during the, uh, during the release, uh, which part of the uh, functionality has been added uh, or removed. And apart from that, uh, uh, I would like to highlight that 
uh, we can easily roll back the function, uh, perform the rollback if any, anything goes wrong after the production deployment. So yeah, we can revert, uh, revert it back. Uh, so let's imagine, yeah, we set up the templates for user stories. We define Salesforce personas, uh, set up the version control system, and uh, uh, yeah. So now the project starts, and we uh, uh, begin to deploy some, uh, develop something. So here, I would uh, uh, want to uh, talk about uh, four aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, is evaluation of the impact. It should be done from development uh, from developer team. Rollback plan as well. It's uh, responsibility for developers. Validation including unit tests, developers as well, and user acceptance testing. It's um, responsibility of business side. Uh, evaluation of the impact. What I mean by that? So, let's imagine the example that so we have a requirement that we need to implement a validation rule. Uh, and uh, what always the developer, the development team always should consider, okay, we uh, when we release the, uh, uh, the this validation rule, can we expect that any anything goes wrong? Because it's an often case when let's say we implement validation to prevent sales users to make some changes uh, 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 during the records update, but as a result, records are not created, like leads are not created, or cases are not created at all because of this validation. Or uh, uh, another use case when we have some field that should be implemented and some automation to populate this field, and this field is, yeah, uh, needs to be populated for all records, but yeah, automation is deployed, the new field is deployed, but the legacy records for those legacy records, the, this field was not updated. So uh, in this, uh, in those scenarios, all of those are automations uh, and existing data. Apart from that, I would highlight integration as well. So if you develop something related to automation, integration, and yeah, uh, that is, uh, related to existing data, we should check yeah, what, what, it, or what negative impact it can cause and what should we do as a post-deployment steps or pre-deployment steps. Uh, rollback plan, uh, yeah, I already mentioned that when I mentioned VCS. So it, um, it, more, it is more related uh, and highly recommended for high impact functionality when you expect that yeah, so the impact is pretty high, and yes, yeah, some things go uh, can go wrong. Uh, you consider, for example, yeah, these functionalities can high risky. So yeah, the um, set of steps should be prepared. Like uh, when we deploy something and anything anything is go wrong, what should we do to roll back it to the previous version? Uh, validation included unit st uh, tests. It's uh, also more uh, uh, advance, uh, advice for developers. Uh, let me clarify. So Salesforce does not require uh, to run unit tests when we deploy migrate functionality from sandbox to sandbox. And it's pretty often case when we, so we have a deployment day, we arrange the deployment day, uh, uh, approved from uh, all uh, sites and yeah start deployment and but yeah we have test failures uh, uh, for the unit tests or not enough coverage and yeah because yeah developers did not run the validation against sandboxes uh, and yeah these should be done uh, on yeah periodic manner and yeah it will could uh, yeah reduce the issues during the deployment yeah uh so uh yeah uh and at the final i would like to yeah describe some action that we recommend to perform after deployment yeah so smoke tests uh those should be done always uh uh yeah 
for when we define the test strategy, we sh should define the uh, uh, the people responsible for uh, to check. Okay, we deploy something. Does it work or not? In general, second is evaluation of the impact. Uh, sometimes, uh, not sometimes. Uh, so, uh, I would recommend uh, when we deploy some feature or a bug fix for some period of time. Uh, the outcomes of the implemented functionality should be tracked. Either it is report, either uh, or a uh, so-called query that is run on a periodic basis. Uh, we should track uh, uh, the data that answers the question, is the new feature stable? Is there are any errors or gaps in the results that we expect from this uh, feature or uh, bug fix? And yeah, at the final, it's just a recommendation because uh, yeah, for developers, it's always a pleasure to receive uh, positive feedback about the implemented functionality. Uh, yeah, because it can help to boost morale and keep uh, developers uh, motivated. And yeah, it's always a pleasure to receive uh, positive feedback because yeah, we receive feedback, uh, positive feedback, not so often as negative feedback. Yeah, so uh, uh, this is uh, yeah what I would recommend uh, uh, to do to improve the overall quality of the project. Uh, yeah, to summarize, uh, yeah, following these rules, I've uh, the rule I've mentioned, you can spend less time on hot fixes and have less uh, stress during the deployment. If you have any questions, I would glad to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. That's much appreciated. Is anybody in the room or anybody online got any questions for Eugene? Hey, yes. Gary. Oh. Go ahead, Gary. Have you got any um, any tools that you recommend during this process? Not necessarily tools to do the deployment itself, but tools to track the things that you were you were talking about. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would stick to Jira and Confluence. So yeah, this is the best tools that uh, uh, yeah I've worked on, I worked with to yeah to implement uh, uh, this uh, strategy. The smoke test. Okay, so the smoke test. It's like a yeah a, a positive test to check. Uh, let's say we implemented some. I don't know. Let's have an example. Uh, we implemented additional uh, a quick action on the account object that if you click on it, let's say it, uh, uh, yeah, a pop-up appears and then we uh, uh, populate the data in it and yeah, the task is created, let's say that. And yeah, the a smoke test is check, okay, do we have this button uh, on the page layout? When we press it, does the pop-up appear? And uh, yeah, so just check the positive scenario if it works in general, because yeah, for sometimes we deploy something, but we, some steps uh, step is missed, and yeah, the functionality does not work. David, uh, uh, Eugene, what do you use? Uh, what do you use for impact analysis? Are there any tools you use for that? You'd recommend? So for the for the impact, uh, so yeah, it depends. It's uh, yeah, it depends based on the uh, requirements. So uh, from, uh, yeah, for the majority of cases, the uh, the report uh, standard Salesforce report uh, uh, is enough uh, to prepare a report and check the data on a periodic basis. Uh, and apart from that, yeah, uh, and apart from that, uh, uh, the implementation itself. So when we have some errors, we create error log records and yeah, prepare a dedicated report, particularly for this functionality, for uh, uh, for the sorry, uh, for uh, error log records that are related to this functionality, and that's how uh, the uh, uh, the impact can be tracked. Okay, thanks. Just one final question for me, uh, Eugene. Um, Gary asked a question about the um, you know, tools for you know, for tracking the changes what kind of tools do you use for managing deployments so there are 
uh, uh, so yeah, Salesforce provides uh, two like chain sets and currently uh, recently it released its own like CI CD process is pretty rough. It's in be uh, beta. Apart from that, uh, yeah, developers pretty much like uh, 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 Git remote repositories and such development tools like GitLab CI CD or Jenkins. And apart from that, there are some tools like Gearset, pretty efficient uh, uh, from my point of view, but yeah, more for admins, I would say, and uh, Copado as well. So all these tools are uh, used, but yeah, me as a developer, I would recommend to yeah, to always have the Git repository in this case. Uh, yeah, if everything is set up correctly, then yeah, there are less issue and less misunderstanding, especially when a lot of uh, uh, a lot of develop. Uh, yeah, the team is uh, pretty big, and yeah, there are a lot of teams and um, more. Uh, uh, there are a lot of developers that working simultaneously on the same environment. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Eugene. Appreciate it. That was a, a great presentation. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. So we now move on to um, onto the quiz. So if uh, if you'd like to participate, I'm just going to um, sh pass my screen sharing. and she's going to talk to us about uh, custom metadata. So over to you, Michelle. Well, good evening for everyone in uh, England and the UK. Uh, over here, it's about just afternoon, so I'm joining you from the US. So today we're going to talk about custom metadata, and I know I'm on a pretty short schedule here, so I'm going to try and keep within my allotted time. Um, but really, it's it's the ultimate Swiss Army knife. It has so many different uses that it's just really cool to put this tool in your tool belt. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm very active in the Salesforce community. I have presented at a number of different user groups and uh, events. I actually co-lead my own user group uh, in Iowa, so I'm thrilled to be able to support other user group leaders around the world. Um, I'm part of the planning committee for a couple of different Dreaming events here in the US. Uh, and of course, I am uh, honored to be part of the Salesforce MVP program as well. So thank you for inviting me to, to come and present. But you're really here to hear content, so let's talk about that. So we'll talk about what custom metadata is, if you've never heard of it or don't really know. Then we're going to go through a sample use case, and I'm going to demo it for you. And then we'll talk about some additional use cases to help you get inspired uh, and start thinking about ideas of how you can use this in your orgs. Okay, so first of all, what is custom metadata? Is anybody here familiar with that? This is really not going to work well on, uh, on virtual, so that's okay. But I saw you, Dean, raise his hand, so thank you. So custom metadata is a way for you to build records that are designed to control how Salesforce works not to hold data that you want your users to interact with. So this is different than using a custom object like accounts or opportunities or standard objects. You may create your own custom. These are slightly different. Because they're metadata and not data, they're deployable from a sandbox. So that great presentation we just had about deployment tools, you can use any of those to actually deploy your custom metadata information from sandbox to production or a package from one dev org to another. It's also available for you to reference in a variety of places, formula fields, validation rules, flow, and apex. 
This actually started out as a developer tool, tr truly, but there is a lot that you can do with it as an admin. So it's great that we're finally getting some visibility into how we as admins can do this. And if you've ever used a custom label or a custom setting to hold information, this is a more flexible way uh, that you can do that. It gives you a little bit more versatility. And truly, it's as easy as building a custom object. So if you have done that in Salesforce, you can work with custom metadata. So some of the things that you would use this for, mapping data or building relationships. So if you want to map a country or a county or a province to a specific region, um, that's not a standard field in Salesforce. So if I want the US and Canada to be part of my Amer region, but I want France and England and Scotland and Italy to all be part of EMEA, I can build a mapping in custom metadata that says this country belongs to this region and then leverage that throughout my org. You can use it to create business rules. So who should certain alerts go to, for example, and we'll use that in our demo later. You can also use this to create master data. So I have whole, um, actually used it to hold data that I want to use to create a variety of different types of records with default values that change. So while when you create a field, you can give it a default value, or you can write a fairly complicated formula to try and give it different default values, uh, you can also use custom metadata to hold that uh, information and then use that when you're creating records. And then finally, if you're working with integrations, storing API keys uh, securely is also something that you can do with custom metadata. There are a few things that you can't do with it, and you need to be aware of these when you're making the decision what tool to use. So first of all, because it's metadata and not data, you can't report on it. So uh, for example, I was asked, I had a list of all of these different record templates that we could create, and someone asked me to run a report or a list of them, and I went, I can't. All right, had to come up with a different solution. So they are also not able to be created in mass or uploaded in mass, like with data loader. Again, because it's not data, it's metadata. You may be able to do this with an API if you're a developer, but for those of us who are configuration only admins, um, that doesn't really work. It's a little bit difficult to navigate. Um, it does not have a really nice page layout and list views uh, like a standard object would. Um, it does have a list view, but if you get into a record, it's a little bit more difficult to get back out of it. Also, not every field type that you get on your custom objects are supported. So you cannot do auto number. Um, you can't do multi-select pick lists, for example. Encrypted is not supported. And if you have a lookup field, it can only look up to another custom metadata object. It can't look up to anything like user, for example. Okay, so I said it's more flexible uh, than custom labels and custom settings. So here's kind of a little table that we put together to help you understand when you should use which tool. So custom metadata and custom labels are both metadata, custom settings or data. So you can move the first two as part of your change sets between orgs and, and with the last one, you actually have to recreate them or use data loader to get it in. Um, custom labels and custom settings, if you're using them in flows, they're accessible with a global variable, but it's gonna cost you a query in flow to look up that custom metadata object for right now. And then custom metadata really gives you the ability to have a framework like you can with an object, multiple fields of different types. And so will custom settings, but custom labels is literally like just a single field, a text field that you're gonna put information in. So it's important to think about these different trade-offs and determine which you're going to use for your specific use case. Okay, so for me, that's great. Talking about theory, fine, all right, you told me what it is. I, I don't understand it. So usually for me, seeing an example helps. So that's what we're gonna do. So our use case is that we want to avoid hard coding information in flows. Now you've probably all heard, do not hard code an ID anywhere. Don't put it in a flow, don't put it in your process, don't write it into your validation rule. Well, there's more things than that that you should really avoid hard coding. Things that can change over time and are likely to change over time. 
uh, because technically anything could change, right? But things that are more likely to change is what we want to identify for moving outside of hard-coded and into um, custom metadata. So for example, sending notifications to specific individuals. So I have three different examples. Um, if we have a support manager who's overseeing our support team and we have a case that comes in and our SLA says we need to have someone take ownership of that case within 10 minutes. So if 10 minutes pass and it's still in new status, I want to notify someone that that case is still pending. Now you might be thinking, all right, why do I need custom metadata for this? Why don't I just go put a checkbox on the user record that says support manager, check the box and use that? That's fair, thought about that. But then what if we also need a sales manager to do this and a business development manager for this? So now all of a sudden I have three checkboxes on a record. Mm, that's not great. So somebody says, well, then use a pick list and pick. Okay, that's fine until all of a sudden our business development manager goes on maternity leave and the sales manager agrees to pick up that responsibility, but it's a pick list and I can only have one value and do not even suggest to me that I should use a multi-select pick list, not gonna happen. Just not gonna happen. So instead, I can avoid burning the fields on the user. I can use a custom metadata object to set this up and hold it and reference that record instead. And it's easy as updating a record field when I need to change it. All right, so it's demo time. Let me pull up my org here. Gotta make sure how we're doing on time. So. In setup, I am going to just search for meta and it's gonna pull up our custom metadata. So when I pull up the custom metadata screen, it's gonna show me all of the objects. So these are basically custom metadata objects. You can think of them very similarly to just a regular custom object. And so I have built one here called routing recipient. And so this is gonna tell me who I want to route certain things to. I have the standard fields that you would get with anything that you create from a custom object. And then I have the ability to build my own custom fields. So again, email address, first or group name, last name, the user or group ID. Those are the fields that I felt was important for me to capture for what I wanted to do with this. So as you can see, they're all text. I can give them a length, obviously. I don't need more than 18 characters for that 18 character ID, so I can limit that field here. So, and this is as simple as creating a custom object. So now that we have created the object, now I'm gonna create my records. And so this is where I'm gonna go into my manage routing recipients. And so again, I can have several different uh, recipients here, different records for different case uh, scenarios. So we're gonna use our unassigned case. And if I come in here, I just gave it a label. And so it also has an API name with the underscore here. I can specify an email address. I can specify the first and last name. And if I wanted to, I could put in the user or group ID, but it does not have to be a Salesforce user. I can assign this to any user or any email address that I have. So even if they're outside of Salesforce, this is supported. So, and just to underline that, my user in here has an email of Michelle does Salesforce, but when we're talking about our custom metadata, we're gonna be sending it to my other Gmail account which is not tied to my user in Salesforce at all. Okay, so five minutes left, we'll go through this very quickly. I have a flow here where I'm going to say, all right, if we create a case, so anytime it's created, I have two things happening. Immediately, I'm gonna run through all of my open opportunities and I'm gonna notify by email the owners of my opportunity that a case has been created for an account they're trying to sell to. We don't like unhappy people. You shouldn't ask people who have problems with your product to buy more of your product until you fix their problems. But if after 10 minutes, we have not touched their case or for demo purposes, we're gonna use two, um, I want an email to go to the support manager. And so how I built this is we determine after two minutes if the case status is still new, then we're using this get records to go to my custom metadata object, which you'll notice has a, the suffix of MDT instead of underscore underscore C. So we're gonna do this. I'm gonna find the one with the label with the name of unassigned case. And then when I put this into my email, I'm using the email address field from that custom metadata record here as my recipient email address. 
All right, so we're going to go over here to cases. We're going to cheat, and I'm going to clone a case real quick. So we're going to clone this. They're pretty unhappy because now performance is not adequate for the fourth consecutive week. So, all right, case 130 has been recreated. So now we just need to wait two minutes for all of our emails to show up. And to prove that our flow is running, I am actually an opportunity owner. So United Oil and Gas Corp has a couple of different opportunities that are not closed one. So over here on this one, if I do a quick refresh, I have my first email. Then a new case has been opened for United Oil and Gas. And because I am an opportunity owner, I get that notification. And at this point, I'm just trying to burn another minute. So, but yeah, I was able to just give it um, a simple subject, which is kind of cool because you can mix regular text along with your um, variables. So I can pull the case number from the record. Then also I can use a text template to actually put in the body of the email so it's nicely formatted. It's got some bold so I can see that. I can actually include a link here so I can get right to that case. And I can have the spacing the way I want it. It's not just a plain text email where everything gets squished together. So that's kind of the beautiful thing about using text templates. All right, so we have about another minute to wait. So while we're waiting, I'm going to hop back over to our presentation real quick. So some additional things that you can use this for. If you have a zip or a postal code and you want to map that to a county, I know that's something here in the US we do quite frequently, um, that's not standard functionality. Um, if you have very complicated assignment rules for account or opportunity teams or even leads, you can build in your assignment structure. So maybe it's by state or by county or by region or by some other combination that gets too complicated for lead assignment rules um, or other assignment rules, you can do that here. When we do development, I use t-shirt sizes. Oh, that's a small, that's an extra large. My boss hated it. My boss is like, can you please tell me how many hours that is? So I'm like, okay. So if I say it's a small project, that's probably, I don't know, two days. If I say it's an extra large project, I'm looking at probably two weeks. So I was able to create a mapping where I was able to put a t-shirt size in and it would automatically then in a formula field, pull in the hour range that was tied to that specific t-shirt size. Creating record templates. Um, so again, if you wanna create um, basically templated information and records, instead of being able to use default values, if you've got multiple different types that need to be created in the same record type, um, you can use it for that. I've used it to map pick list values to records. So we were tracking competitors. And so I had a pick list with the names of all of my competitors on an object, but they decided they actually wanted to have a related list that linked an account to another account. And we tracked our competitors and accounts. So I used that to automate it so they wouldn't have to create both the pick list and the record. I also use custom metadata to build my own miniature version of CPQ. It was one of those things where I didn't need CPQ but I needed more flexible pricing than what I could do with just um, sales cloud. All right, so we have had our two minute wait. So I'm gonna pop back over here and we're gonna go to my email address. Do a quick refresh here. Oh, look, I've sent myself a message that I still have a case in new status. So, I'm not real nice to myself internally. It's like the case is still new, fix it. So, but this is where I was able to grab an email address and send an email to someone who is completely unrelated to my Salesforce org. So, all right. So finally, um, this deck was made available to the group. So we'll make sure to get this out. Um, but here are a number of resources that you can use uh, to learn more about custom metadata types and some ideas on how you might be able to use them as well as a little bit um, on why it's quite so bad to hard code things in Salesforce and what you can do to get around that.
So, all right. Sorry, two minutes over. With that, I'll pass it back to uh, you all. But thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle. That was a, that was a good session. Thanks very much. Does anybody um, online or in the room have any questions for Michelle? I'll, I'll ask a question, any, Michelle. Any, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gary. I just say any limitations you've come across, Michelle? Not for what I've needed it for yet. Um, okay. I think it's one of those things where I know what custom metadata can be used for or should be used for. So I've tried to limit my use of it to those things. It's kind of like not trying to use a hammer when I really need a screwdriver. Yep. So Perfect. use the right tool for the job. Okay. Have you come across any uh, situations where it's used um, with uh, approvals? We've, we've, we've got a couple of uh, things that uh, have, have come into us recently where I think the standard approval mechanism isn't flexible enough to, to model what the customer is trying to achieve. So I'm intrigued as to whether you've, you've seen any um, custom metadata used in, in approvals at all. I have not seen that, but it would make sense that you would be able to build a version of an approval process using Flow or Flow Orchestrator uh, and leverage custom metadata for some of the requirements on if it's A plus B plus C, go to Mark. If it's A plus B plus D, send it to Delia. If it's A and it's D but not B or C, send it to Gary. So I think you could absolutely start building something out that would say, here's the set of circumstances, and if this combination together is met, send it to this person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. Great. Oh, that's good to hear that. Thanks, Michelle. Absolutely. Any more questions, Any more questions for Michelle? Great. Thanks very much, Michelle. Great. Thanks for having me. I'll hang around till the end of questions, just in case. Much appreciated. Okay, um, thanks very much uh, for that presentation there. So I'd, I'd now like to um, turn over uh, the podium to uh, Mark Jones. Um, uh, many of you will know Mark from his his work with uh, with, with Trailhead, with uh, his um, blogs on various admin uh, aspects and flow, for example. And uh, Mark has recently uh, taken up a new role as a Salesforce consultant at Time Technology. So um, I'd like to hand over to you, Mark, to introduce yourself and share your screen, if you would, please. Great. No worries. Thank you very much, Paul. So let me just share my screen and we'll get that up and running. Just before you start, Mark, I'm just going to reset the sound in here. Just give me give me 30 seconds. No worries. This is where I've got a mess with the tech again. and It's bound to go wrong. <coughs> Let's try that. Has it gone wrong? Yeah, it has. It's just, just, just leave well alone, Paul. That's the message, isn't it? All right, there we go. Right, I think we might be in good shape, Mark. If you want to uh, take the floor again. Great, no worries. Thank you. So let me just share my screen and we'll begin. So you should should hopefully be able to share, see my screen in just a second. And let me just switch over to that window so I can see it myself. Great. So thanks again for, for having me, everyone. It's great to, to be here. Uh, th th this presentation we'll be doing is just a little bit around uh, some content on flow documentation. Uh, in all transparency, you, uh, as this uh, user group here at Cosmos, are a bit of my guinea pigs for this. So... Uh, I would love to hear your your feedback in terms of like what you found helpful with this uh, for future learning. This is something I've been planning on trying to do more content on uh, for about a year now, and so this is kind of what we're we're working on today. Uh, but this presentation is briefly called "Epic Tips to Help You Create Epic Flow Documentation." Uh, so we're going to get into that. I will try. I've got a a flow to show you to show you some examples of the points i'm going to mention hopefully i'll be able to show that off i will aim to do that in the time that we've got uh, just don't really necessarily need to go over and see who who i am too 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 much uh, but this is a little bit about who i am i'm very much involved in the community as a user group leader and uh, quite a few different other things as well um and i i blog at my new blog called the the flow architect uh which is a blog specifically focused on flow. Uh, so that's a little bit about myself. Uh, so you get to know a little bit about who I am. 
But let's let's dive in into what I'm going to be talking. We're going to be covering today. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about how we can do some stuff to document our flows inside Salesforce. There's a few things that we can do. Uh, I'm also going to share about some additional documents that we can create. Uh, my hope was to have templates available in the resources for this session. Unfortunately, I'm not quite ready to share them yet, but they will be available uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, there will be a QR code that you'll be able to see where you can scan and get access to the resources for this session. Uh, and I'll make this presentation available as well. But if you scan that QR code, I'll update that uh, spreadsheet with the resources in uh, over the next few weeks and include those uh, templates in once I have them ready to uh, talk about. I'm happy for them to be shared out. Uh, so basically, I don't want you to have access to things which I don't feel are quite uh, high quality enough yet to be shared. And then finally, I'll, I'll share my tips for creating uh, some flow documentation. I've called it epic flow documentation, but that is more just kind of a way to make the title sound more appealing and friendly. So if you have built flow documentation yourself, uh, please do feel free to, to share in the chat or uh, even in the Q&A what you have picked up from building your own flow documentation if you have. So moving on to kind of like how we can document our flows inside of Salesforce. Uh, there's a few, there's quite a few different things that we can actually do inside of Salesforce to document um, and including, and the main things I would say for that is to do things like populate your description fields. Uh, and we now have description bubbles in the spring 23 release, if you have seen that, and I'll show just demo this in a brief second. Uh, we also have the ability to add inline comments to formers and validation rules inside of Flow. Uh, and what that is, is just basically, it's just a couple of symbols of, of code that you can add where you can then add some comments in there, which will not affect the calculation of the formula or the validation rule. And again, I'll show you that in a second as well. Uh, we could also create custom list views to help display and organize our flows. So if you want to see have a your flows grouped by object or by the type of flow, you can create list views to help you with that. And that is a, in, a, in a way a helpful form of kind of helping with your documentation efforts. And then the last bit I will mention, uh, there is a really good good blog about this on Automation Champion about naming conventions, but a good, really helpful methodology for working with documentation in flows is to decide upon a naming convention uh, for API names in flows and being consistent with it where possible. Uh, and as a side note as well, it's not something I would I use too much for the documentation side, but you can actually report on screen flow elements and orchestration work items inside of Salesforce. Um, that is more to showcase what has been run and what has happened rather than actually just kind of report on what uh, flows exist. So that's something you could, you can potentially use a little bit, but it's not something I would put so highly on the um, podium in terms of documenting. Uh, flows. Briefly, just so well, I'm going to show you very quickly what those points I've just mentioned inside of Salesforce. So I'm just going to come out of the screen and go into my flow here. And I've you can see here I've got an example flow that I've just been building out for uh, testing out these code comments. And you can see, so if I was to go into this screen here, you can see I have a description I've put in there just to say that this is an example screen element. Uh, so my recommendation would be to fill in these as much as possible uh, within your flows so that you have some good uh, descriptions in there uh, and also to populate the description in your main flow uh, settings. But if I come over here for just a second and hover over this little icon you can see to the right here, which appears when we add a description, you can see the description bubble there highlighting that. Uh, so I would personally recommend including some information about what that element is and what that element is meant to be doing. Here for this, this demo, I've just included this as to say this is an example screen element. But if you are adding uh, a screen element or any other element, I would include something that's a bit more uh, describes what that element is meant to be doing inside your floor. 
just briefly just to show you as well here's where the description fee description is for the floor in your settings cogwheel i haven't got a description in here for this this demo but i would recommend when you're building out floors to before you deploy them into production ensure that you have this completed and uh, that would be my personal advice on that in terms of uh, comments within the uh, within formers if i was to come into my format i've created for a test with comment you can see here and let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see the symbol if you add in a a forward slash and a star um and then for closing to do a star and then the forward slash you can add in comments in here and for this i would just simply recommend just putting in some information that is pertinent to whatever that resource is in this case the formula so i've just put a simple uh dummy example to say if if successful this formula should display the value of two just to say if it's calculated successfully so i'm going to come out of that and i will show you as uh, validation rule uh, comments as well so if i come back into my screen and i scroll down into my validation rules let me just come back onto here onto the test here and i'm going to go to validate input you can see here i've got a validation message i'm just going to zoom in so you can see that a little bit, bit better you can see here i've got a, an error message to say what that the date in this example should equal today and if i scroll down to the to the formula you'll see here i've got a formula here to say what the date should be and that should be today and if i scroll down you can see here just in the same way i've added a comment in there to say what the how what should happen with that validation rule inside of that so that's stuff you can do inside a flow uh within that you can also do comments like this inside of regular formula fields and standard validation rules so you can include them in there as well you can also include comments in in apex as well if you work with apex at all so let me come out come out of that and i'm going to go back into my floors so you can see list views so you can see here i've got two list views that i've created i've got a, a screen flows list view and i've got a triggered flows uh list view you can create these like you would with any standard list view inside a side of salesforce if i just come into your settings call will create a new and you can also edit and select which fields you want to add in there you can see here all, all the list of the fields that we have uh, and you can add in any of the fields on the available side and we can you can also edit your filters so for this i've got the the process type filtered down to screen floor so this is basically just creating a list of all of my screen floors inside of this org as well and then the the last bit that i had mentioned if i just we go back to my site was actually uh, going about cust uh, api naming conventions so let me just load back into my floor here that we had before and what you can see if i come into here you can see here for example i've got a an api name here again i'll zoom in a little bit so you can see there i've got the api name here uh, this is a variation of a naming pattern called camel case um, but you can also use uh, the standard Salesforce one uh, as much if you like as well. Uh, the benefit I find with using a convention like where you have the say, for example, screen first is if I come into the toolbox, you'll be able to see that all my formulas begin with formula. And if I was to scroll down to the elements, you can see here I've got all of my input uh, input fields with input at the beginning and i've got all of my display with display at the beginning so it kind of groups them together in terms of how you you put you see them organized in there you can see the same with screens there as well so that's a little bit of a whistle stop tour on in terms of what you can do within salesforce so let's come back to the slides and i will have a look at the q a in just a second if there's anything coming up so in terms of additional documents uh, that you sh maybe should consider creating um i've put down on here a 
a strategy for how you govern uh, your flows and your flow documentation. So having that written down somewhere uh, would be very helpful. And really, see, all that needs to be essentially, in my view, is just basically a overview of how you're going to, uh, what's going to be in your documentation, how you're going to use that, and who's going to make essentially who's going to maintain it, and how that all that kind of stuff works out. Uh, another bit I think is quite helpful when it comes to in terms of documentation efforts is a scheduled flow calendar. Uh, if you've used scheduled flows uh, before, you'll know you can set up them to run uh, either just once or you can set them up to run uh, daily uh, or, or weekly and you can set up the times that you have. Um, a schedule flow calendar in, can be a very helpful thing. It's just basically would be a list of when each flow would is scheduled to run. Um, that can be in a Word document or I've also done it in a Google calendar before. So you can just have a, a calendar on there where you can see which flows are meant to run when and that can give you an, op an opportunity to track uh, when your schedule flows are due to run. Another, another one for, for me I think is a good idea is a flow change log. Uh, so what I would recommend in terms of how you document your flow overall is have a document per flow where you go into what the flow is, what its purpose is, what business problems it solves. And at the end of that document, have a change log. And that is basically the whole idea for that would be just to track what, when changes have been made, uh, who has made them, and if you have a have a requirement where you you want your changes to your flows approved, who signed off on those changes? Um, you might not need to have that sign off on there, but basically a change log is will be looking for what's changed, who changed it, and when was it changed, uh, as well as tracking the the version number as well. And then the last bit I I've got in here, which is something I wish I had the template of to show you to hand, is a what I'm referring to as a flow glossary. Uh, and in that, that's kind of a, a resource I would have at the end of your document where basically you you, you list out your, your your variables and your uh, your resources that you want to have in that document to cover what's included in there and explain it. And it doesn't have to be massively rocket science, I don't think, on that. But what you want to see with that is, say, if you've got, for example, a uh, a formula in there that calculates, you could have that in there, like you saw in that example. Um, or you could have your, your record variables and things like that, just a list of what resources you have in your flow uh, that you feel needs to be included in that document. And I mentioned before, I recommend adding them at the end of your main document for the flow. Uh, one other document which I haven't added on this list, which I think is potentially a good idea as well, is just a singular piece of singular document, which would just be a list of all of your flows, and then the, to hyperlink that to all of your your documents that you create for your individual level uh, documents for each flow, um, and that and also include a link to your schedule flow calendar if you go down that route. So that's additional documents I would consider creating. Um, I will have templates to say towards the end of this month for for these things that you will be able to, able to see, uh, and I'll be sharing them in that resources uh, spreadsheet you'll get to see in just a little bit. In terms of the tips for, for myself, and I'd love to hear if anybody has any different views on this, but for me, what I would recommend is to not overcomplicate things. Uh, with flow, it can be very easy to get probably into some of the, the weeds, maybe a little bit too much going through uh, all of the little minute details in the flow, but your flow documentation for it to be the most benefit should really kind of explain what the automation is doing, why it's needed, and what business problems it solves. Uh, the technical level stuff, generally speaking, would probably be more read by uh, admins, consultants, those people who would be working on maintaining the flow, uh, generally speaking. So while I think there's that's there's a place for that information, for, for sure, um, you don't necessarily want to overcomplicate the document by going into every little tiny detail necessarily, but that's a decision that you would want to make. I've also put that about snapshotting your canvas and your elements. Uh, basically, by I just mean screen screenshots and put them into those documents. Uh, if you write documentation uh, on anything, you'll know that uh, images can be very, very helpful in that, in terms of explaining what's going on within whatever you're documenting. 
Uh, in terms of descriptions, uh, keeping them clear and concise. Uh, and by that, I just simply mean you're having it so that you can read that and you can understand what that particular item you're describing is, whether that's a, a variable, whether that's a formula or uh, an element uh, or anything else inside the floor that you add descriptions to, just so you can have a clear and that it makes sense to whoever would be looking at that floor. Uh, labels as well, that's a bit of a thing I've gone back and forth on in recent in the last year, largely because of uh, slack, if I'm honest. But I'm kind of more towards the train of keeping your, your labels relatively short but descriptive uh, so that you can wait, you can have a look at them and you can understand straight away what that, that thing is meant to be. So, for example, if you haven't seen an update element, having the codes, update, and then whatever you're updating. So if it's, say, updating contact, or updating related contacts or something like that. Those are potentially good examples of uh, labels for elements inside of a flow, in my opinion. And as well, as you build out your documentation, uh, keep in mind specific items relating to different flow types. So we talked about that before about scheduled triggered flows. So that would be for that, that would be when the fight when it triggers on, on the schedule. Uh, for things like record trigger flows, you'd be looking at things like the the trigger order uh, for that if you are using trigger order, which is something I would also recommend for record triggered flows. And also be mindful and document any potential impact that the flow will have. So when we build any automation, it can all, it can have a knock on impact on potentially other automation if there's things like apex uh, triggers inside of your your org. Uh, it can also impact other flows and potentially other integrations. So if you are able to to document that, that is very, very helpful in there. And then the last two bits, make a note of your flow version. I think that is quite an important one because as uh, you might be aware, there is a limit of 50 versions per flow uh, at the moment. So in if you build a flow, the maximum limit is 50 flows, uh, 50 versions of that flow. Uh, so when you get to say 49 nine versions, you might want to you'll probably want to consider uh, taking away some of those older versions that aren't active anymore. And as well in the documentation, as simple as it sounds, know why it's needed and what business problem it solves. At the end of the day, when we build automation, the idea for us is that we would be building it to solve a business problem uh, that the organizations that we are building them for uh, are dealing with. So you want to basically know why the floor was needed and what it solves. So those are my, my overall tips for creating documentation. Uh, just to kind of share towards before we move into the questions. Um, I do have a this resources slide, as I mentioned before. Um, this is a, is a Google Sheet with some resource links on there, and I will be continuing to populate that over the next number of weeks, as I mentioned, just so you you can get those those templates I've mentioned that aren't quite ready yet. And also there's some other blogs I've included in that as well. So I'll leave it out for a second just to give people just a quick chance to scan that. And then I now I will move on to my final bit, which is a little bit of selfish promotion. Uh, over the course of this month, I'm going to be putting together uh, a blog each week on documentation uh, on this, this topic. and the first blog is out, uh, came out today, came out just about an hour or so ago. And then there's going to be a new post each week uh, going forward until the end of the month. And uh, next week, we're going to be talk. I'm going to be talking a bit about what you've seen a little bit tonight about what you can use inside of Salesforce to document, uh, to help your documentation efforts. And then we'll be, be kind of going through a few other topics towards the end of the month. And with that, just want to say a big thank you and just to see if there's any questions. So let me just have a quick look at the at the chat and see if there's any questions in there to see what's if anything's come up. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Michelle, for mentioning about camel case. Yes, that's really helpful. In terms of that. Yeah. Yeah. So the camel case will be lower case at the beginning. And then F, the beginning of every subsequent word, including that, would be capitalized. Yes. So thank you, Mark. Does anybody have any questions for sure. Mark? Just got one. Go ahead, um, David. Mark, are there any documentation tools that you would recommend to capture all that stuff? 
Yeah. Uh, so for me, the main I'm building this out in uh, my documentation I'm building. Now I've got a couple of different versions because I'm trying to create some different versions of it. I'm using the tool called Notion to do my doc a lot of my documentation. Um, that's a uh, basically a free kind of like document creator you can use, so you can essentially create a lot of different things. So that's called Notion, um, which I really I've used that for quite a few years. Um, I also uh, just using Google Docs standard templates on there, um, so that you can use that. Um, in terms of um, say things like the canvas, if you were to take out the canvas, uh, Lucid Chart is also a good uh, tool for that as well. Um, and I'm hope I'm going to be trying to do a bit of stuff with Elements Cloud because I can see what I can do with that as well. But main, main ones I use is Notion and Google Docs right now. Great, thanks. If you if you want to have a chat about Elements Cloud at any point, then uh, that, that's what I do. So if you want to hook up on that, one, thank you. Okay, I, I've got a question, Mark. I was having a, uh, I was interviewing a developer uh, yesterday um, who was um, starting to undertake some more admin-focused tasks and had been introduced uh, to Flow, you know, from compared with Apex and so on. And one of the observations he made, which I thought I'd run by you today, is that is, is there any way that you've come across where you can save um, reusable elements or you know reusable resources? Um, or reusable components from flows so that you can go back and say, do you know, what? I'm just going to grab those little bits and put them together. Is there anything that you're aware of that allows you to do that? Yeah, um, I mean, so to, to slightly pick on Michelle, Michelle might have some some thoughts yeah. uh, uh, that I miss. Then when I hear that kind of question, the main thing I think of straight away is a subflow. So if you build out your whatever you're you're wanting to do and use again and again as a, an auto launch flow. You can bring that into other floors as a subfloor, uh, and as, as long as you can ensure that you populate any element, any um, variables that you need to include within that. So my head straight away goes to subfloors on that. Um, but I, I, sorry to pick on you there, <laughs> Michelle, on that one, but I don't know if I've thought if there's anything that you're aware of that I'm missing on that. So unfortunately, my audio cut out. I and I missed the question. Yeah, so um, I, I was talking to a developer yesterday, uh, Michelle, that's transitioning into some more admin-focused tasks, and, and he was a little bit um, surprised that there was no mechanism that he was aware of within uh, Flow to create like a library of reusable um, elements or reusable uh, resources or components that he could say, do you know what, I've, I've got that great validation that does this, or I've got this great screen element that does this, that you could then kind of compose a flow from the things that you've built previously. Right. So if if the whole process is the same, absolutely a subflow um, that you can call from anywhere. So like error handling is a great example. If you want to handle an error so that your user doesn't get a bad experience, build that into a subflow and then plug that into every other flow you've got it. Um, yeah. There is an idea out there to be able to save or copy components um, within. So like I built this really awesome screen for this flow and I need two tweaks for this other flow. Why can't I just copy that screen and put it into a new flow? Well, right now that doesn't work. It's not an option, but there are ideas for that. And so I would absolutely encourage you to find them and vote for them. And Mark, you and I need to talk to Diana about that. Yes, maybe we should do that next week. <laughs> uh, that would be a great time to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and just going back to that, that that's subflow point. So, like for example, one of the things I have as a routine um, auto launch flow I build and use as a subflow is uh, custom notifications. Um, so I have a, a subflow I build where I just collect a, a, a custom notification and fire that out, and I use that as a subflow all the time uh, in that uh, quite regularly. So you can build out stuff that you would do routinely as subflows and make it really work well. Um, there is obviously some thought around kind of like the input element, input variables you need to include within that. Um, but I like I would probably now never go back to creating custom notifications in singular flows. Um, and I would probably just opt for using my uh, subflow approach for that because it's just so handy uh, to work with. That's an mm -hmm. example. Yeah, that's that, that's a good shout. Great, thank thank you, Mark. Thank you, Michelle, for that uh, for that response. I shall. 
pass that on to uh, to the chap I was speaking to yesterday. So any more questions from anybody? Okay, fabulous. That was a, um, a really helpful um, presentation, Mark. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for taking us through that. It's uh, great to see you. Congrats on the new job. I hope that works out well for you. Um, and uh, so I guess it now remains, uh, I can't believe we've, we've been sitting here for an hour and a half. It's absolutely whizzed by with all that great content. So I'd, I'd like to um, thank um, uh, all of our speakers um, um, who've uh, taken the time and trouble out to present this evening. So, so thank you very much uh, to uh, Eugene, Michelle and Mark. Let's give them a final one. Thank you so much again for inviting me to come and, and be part of this. Unfortunately, I do have to drop, but I would love to connect with any of you on the internet. So we'll see you later. That sounds good. Well, thank you, Michelle. Have a good evening. So I'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Coacto and uh, Routine uh, Automation, uh, for their uh, uh, funding and time to help make this event uh, happen. I'd like to thank all of you for coming along. Um, it's uh, It's been a really great session. We've got some more sessions lined up. And in fact, if I uh, just quickly share my screen there we go so we've got some more sessions coming up uh for the rest of this year let's just maximize that on the slideshow <clears throat> uh, so our next meeting is on the uh, the 8th of june and we've got meetings in october and december as well so i think the next three months is probably going to fly by so we'd like to, to see you come back either online or in person um to join us for that we've got a chatter group there uh, that you can join and we'll be posting uh, some snippets, uh, some takeaways, and some of the templates and presentations that you've seen this evening. Um, if you'd like to speak at a future event, then come and ask me. Um, we're always looking for, for people to you know, present great ideas, to present great tools, great content uh, experiences. Customer experiences are also particularly good. We've had some really good ones over the last couple of years. So if you'd like to do that, please come and uh, have a chat with me. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming along virtually and in person. I'd like to thank all our speakers and thank all of our sponsors. And um, wherever you are, have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much, everybody.